Daniel Cormier isn't just a fighter, he's a freaking legend. So we get to fight it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that was a good thought to bite the motherfucker. <laughs> this guy clawed his way to the top of the MMA food chain, not just with his fist, but with a stubbornness that makes the average sob story look like a fairy tale. I lost my daughter back in 2003. I've dealt with some shit in my life, man. I don't know, man, I guess if you win both fights, there is no rivalry, so I, I don't know. Thank you for everything. I have had to go through so much. What was it that made Cormier such a great fighter? What, you know, it's like he had a, a combination of things, but in your mind, what made him great? Gritty. He's got, he's got a really good fight IQ. He, he's good at breaking down his point. He's just, he's tough. He's a tough guy. But he didn't just stop at being a champion. He decided to be the champion of the people coach, commentator, community hero. The man's doing it all, laying down the law for what it means to be a real leader in the world of MMA. This is the raw, unfiltered, and inspiring story of Daniel Cormier. On March 20th, 1979, Daniel Cormier was born, a fighter not just in the ring, but in the game of life, coming from the streets of Lafayette, Louisiana. His life story is as if the universe tested the limits of one man's resilience, challenging him to see how much he could endure before breaking. At seven, his Thanksgiving gift was a bullet that robbed him of his father. When I was growing up, like, a lot of black fathers were in and out of the house. They would go, they would come. When my biological dad left, he got remarried, started a new family. I have one memory of my, my biological father, just one. And it's the oddest memory that I, we were at a truck stop. I, I think he was a, a truck driver and we were at a truck stop one day and he was like cleaning his truck. But that's the only memory I have of my, my, my biological dad. But I do remember the day he passed away. I remember being at my aunt's house and we were watching The Color Purple. And, and dude, we were black. I was as black, I'm from a black, black family. Every holiday, we watched The Color Purple, man. Yeah. And um, I just remember my mom getting a phone call and everybody just going absolutely crazy. Crazy. And I was I, I couldn't really understand what, what was going on. And I just remember like going to a funeral for my dad, but not really having that relationship and understanding of what losing my, my dad was. Growing older, I then started to realize what a father was supposed to be in your life, and I understand that he wasn't that. The years that followed presented another horrific loss, the tragic death of his infant daughter, which we'll talk about in a moment. Yet here stands Cormier, not just standing, but towering, a testament to the raw, unyielding spirit of human resilience. This is not just a story of survival, it's a saga of a man who took life's best shots and came out swinging. Wrestling became Daniel's beacon of hope during his darkest days. It all started when a high school coach saw something special in him and nudged him towards the wrestling mat. This nudge turned into a full-blown leap as Daniel embraced wrestling wholeheartedly. I was a kid that was that was broken. You know, I was a kid that got beat on a lot. I was a kid that got bullied a lot. And I needed something to change my thought process, and wrestling was that. He turned Northside High's wrestling scene into his personal empire, clinching three state championships with the ferocity of a man on a mission. There's this confidence that I got from having to stand on my own. I had to actually, it, I was responsible for myself. It's that individualness in wrestling that I love. His high school days were a blur of opponents being slammed, culminating in a brutal record of 101 wins against only nine losses. He was twice crowned the most outstanding wrestler, a title as much about his tenacious spirit as his technical skills. But Cormier wasn't one to be pigeonholed. He also dominated on the football field, a testament to his raw athletic genius. 
After high school, he continued refining his wrestling skills at Colby Community College, obliterating the competition with a perfect streak and bagging two national championships. His record, an untouchable 61 to zero. When he vaulted to Oklahoma State University, it was clear Cormier wasn't there to play. He was there to conquer. Diving into the shark tank of Division I wrestling, he racked up an impressive record, showing the world he was a force to be reckoned with. After that, he took a giant leap into freestyle wrestling and soared to new heights. And then your heart is filled with pride. It's like, you could, you want to be nothing more than an American representing the United States at the Olympic Games. His victory at the 2003 Pan American Games further cemented his reputation as a top wrestler, both in the U.S. and internationally. However, 2003 was a year of extreme highs and devastating lows. While his career was skyrocketing, he experienced a personal tragedy that would change his life forever. His infant daughter passed away in a car accident. There was an accident on the highway and uh, that three people were injured, but there was only one fatality and it was her. The baby strapped in exactly as she's supposed to be. The guy bangs into the back of the car. She died at the scene. I just remember her casket being so, so small. So small. I just remember her in the casket and just not understanding why stuff like that keeps happening. This moment not only tested Cormier's resilience, but also showcased the strength of the human spirit in the face of unimaginable loss. This horrific event left Cormier at the time only 24 with two paths, to step back or to push forward in honor of his daughter. He chose to let this tragedy fuel his determination, dedicating his career and all his achievements to her memory. Cormier's following triumphs, like his heart-stopping performance at the 2004 Athens Olympics, where he finished fourth, or his bronze at the 2007 World Championships, were all fueled by his love for his daughter. In 2008, life threw him another curveball. While cutting weight for that year's Olympics, he suffered kidney failure, a severe health scare that forced him to change career path. That's when he transitioned to mixed martial arts, marking the start of a legendary career in the sport. Wrestling has been, has meant everything to me. It's given me everything, I mean. Without the sport, I would I would still be in Louisiana somewhere. You know, I wouldn't have gone to school and gotten an education. I wouldn't have gone to uh, everything else. You know, it's, it's all because of wrestling. Wrestling yeah, put me in yeah. front of people. You know, from a very young age, I was able to start doing interviews and talking to people and learning how to be confident in front of a in front of a crowd, and and uh, it's allowed me to gain just things that I never thought imaginable. It's just the best sport ever. When Daniel ditched the Olympics for the Savage Ballet of MMA, it wasn't just a career pivot. It was an act of rebellion. Trained by the mad scientists of combat at American Kickboxing Academy, Cormier was groomed to be a weapon. He sparred with Cain Velasquez, John Fitch, and Josh Koshek, who helped him improve as a striker and submission wrestler. You know, I think when you're fighting, you need that one guy that um, elevates you. And, you know, I think all my teammates played that part, you know, like from, from Swick and Fitch and Koscheck and, you know, Habib and Luke Rockhold and, you know. Making his professional debut, Daniel signed an eight fight deal with Strikeforce and debuted defeating Gary Frazier by TKO in September 2009.
After that, he quickly established himself as a powerful competitor in the heavyweight division by winning all his subsequent fights. His winning streak wasn't just luck, it was a loud announcement that a new heavyweight contender had arrived. This led to him being considered as a contender for the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix, a tournament featuring some of the best heavyweights in the world in September 2011. Despite Cormier's reservations about competing in the event due to inexperience, height, and reach disadvantage over the rest of the field, he stepped into the ring against Antonio Silva, a Goliath to his David. Also, he accepted the fight on only five weeks' notice. In a shocking upset, he won the fight in the first round, catching his opponent with multiple hits to the jaw, causing him to collapse and then finishing with two hammer blows to the face of the grounded Silva before the referee could stop the fight. Cormier later revealed that he had broken his hand during the bout. In the end, this wasn't just another fight. It was Cormier's declaration that he belonged among the gods of the sport. In May 2012, Cormier and Josh Barnett clashed in a titanic battle at Strike Force. Barnett versus Cormier. Picture this. Two gladiators at the peak of their powers, locked in combat. Over five grueling rounds, Cormier danced, ducked, and delivered, not just fighting, but narrating a story of determination. The judges saw what we all felt. DC was a force of nature, sweeping the scores and clinching the Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix Champion title. But victory came at a price. Cormier's right hand, a key instrument in his symphony of destruction, was broken again. The warrior's path led him to surgery, but this chapter only added to his legend. I look down on the names on this belt, and it's a complete honor to actually be wearing it. Um, it it's an unbelievable feeling. Daniel, I have to ask you, how much do you bench? Fast forward a year, and Daniel Cormier's record sparkled with an unblemished 11 wins and zero losses setting the stage for his highly anticipated UFC debut. His first test, the formidable Frank Mir, a veteran of the sport. This wasn't just a debut, it was Cormier stepping into the Coliseum, ready to etch his name in the annals of UFC history. Ariel Hawani in San Jose alongside Daniel Cormier, who of course meets Frank Mir this Saturday night at UFC on Fox number seven. And Daniel, welcome. I, I respect Frank for what he did in this sport. But when things start to get a little tough, I, I think he tends to, uh, I mean, he, 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 he will wilt before his opponent most times. You know, I think when in a fight of will and determination, I think I beat Frank every time. I still think that, uh, you know, that uh, stepping in the UFC is going to be a step up for the competition that he's been doing in the strike force. And I think that's where I'll have an advantage at is the fact that I've been here for, you know, over 10 years and this is his debut. On April 20th, 2013, Cormier stormed into the UFC facing off against Frank Mir at UFC on Fox 7. Red trunks for Mir, black trunks for Cormier. Mir, aiming to keep his rival at bay, kicked off with some sharp kicks. Daniel wasn't having any of it, though. He bulldozed through Mir's defense, getting up close and personal in the clinch, where he really put the squeeze on his opponent. He's got Frank tied up against the cage here. Mir, in his limited toolbox, found himself outmatched and outwitted, gasping for air and dignity. Cormier is so explosive in the pace and pressure he keeps. Then came the second act. It was a spectacle of Cormier's sheer will against Mir's fading glimmer of hope, punctuated by a brief moment where Mir thought he saw light, only to be plunged back into the darkness by Cormier's relentless assault. With Cormier constantly struggling to try to get out of his water. The final round was the epitome of desperation meets determination. Mir with whatever fuel left, tried to ignite a comeback, but Cormier shackled him against the cage, a grim reminder of the inevitable. Referee Herb Dean tried to stir the pot, but it was clear. Cormier was the chef in this kitchen, serving up a dish 
of cold, hard victory via unanimous decision. Dana White, however, wasn't exactly over the moon about the fight. He commented Cormier spent more time giving Mir a 15-minute hug session than actually fighting. A mere six months after his hugathon with Mir, Cormier was back at it, squaring off against Roy Nelson and snagging another win by unanimous decision. I'm gonna be the champion eventually. Those guys can't get away from me for long. Congratulations, sir. But that was just the appetizer. The next year, Cormier went on a tear, winning against Patrick Cummins before facing the one and only Dan Henderson. Good, it's good. I go into this chamber like this, right? And I lay there, and it's like filled with oxygen. Like it's just more oxygen than we could ever take in. It helps with the healing. It helps with the, uh, if you have swelling anywhere. All right, you doing all right? Oh yeah. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go back now, have some breakfast, pack my bags up, and head to Vegas. Put your hand on his head. How you doing? Good. What's up? Let's go out, boys. Looks, it looks like you got chicken on your face. <laughs> <laughs> From the get-go, it was clear. This wasn't a fight, it was a clinic. Cormier, with his elite wrestling pedigree, treated Henderson not so much as an opponent, but as a prop in his one-man performance. Dan has Cormier's right arm tied up with his legs, and he's holding on to his left arm like this. He's got him a bit of a cradle. Look at that. He tossed Henderson into the air not once, but twice, as if defying gravity just for kicks. On the ground, it was domination personified, pounding away every time the slightest opportunity presented itself. Then came the grand finale, a rear naked choke in the third, putting an end to the spectacle. Henderson, the living legend, had no answers. He was simply outclassed, outmaneuvered, and ultimately put to sleep. Cormier's victory over Henderson wasn't just another win. It was the key that unlocked the door to one of the UFC's most unforgettable rivalries. Cormier versus Jones. Take a trip back to 2008 with me, where John Jones, bright-eyed and hungry, blasts into the UFC octagon. He's not just fighting, he's making history, becoming the youngest champ by taking down the legendary Shogun Hua. Fast forward to 2013 and Jones is in a cycle, fight, conquer, repeat. It's almost too easy. But wait, along comes Alexander Gustafsson at UFC 165. This fight, it's not just a match, it's an epic saga. Jones, for the first time, is pushed to his limits, but he still emerges victorious, proving champions find a way to win no matter what. This monumental battle was more than a victory, it was a prelude to an epic rematch that almost happened. The MMA gods, however, had other plans as Gustafsson's knee gave out, sidelining him. Enter Daniel Cormier, undefeated and ready to step up. Anytime you have a text from Lorenzo or Dana, you know it's like big news, something's going on. So I, I, uh, I called him back, he said give him a call, I called him back and he offered me this fight. I was still undefeated at the time. 
and we were at the MGM Grand, and he headbutted me, like put his head on me. So I push him. So we get to fighting. <laughs> Oh boy. So we get to fighting, right? And we're fighting, and Joe, the security guard from the UFC, falls under me. But now I'm on my back as we go flying off the stage. I will say there was a thought to bite the motherfucker. Because, like, <laughs> what am I doing on my back? <laughs> <laughs> The Nevada State Athletic Commission was not amused. They came down hard on the duo. Jones faced a punishing $50,000 fine and 40 hours of community service, while Cormier got slapped with a $9,000 fine and 20 hours of making amends. I just think we both acted really immaturely up there. You know, I, I, I think things just escalated way too fast. Uh, so I definitely want to take the time to apologize to all my fans that I may have let down. In the aftermath of the chaos, Nike severed ties with Jones. This wasn't just any deal, it was a groundbreaking partnership that padded his bank accounts by six figures. Suddenly, Jones faced a harsh reality. Cormier didn't just want to dethrone him, he was literally costing him money. And with that, the final piece of the puzzle snapped into place, solidifying what many would call the most intense feud in the history of the UFC. I believe that this fight for me is bigger than Daniel Cormier. It's, it's about what I set out to do a long time ago, and that's be the greatest of all time. Gentlemen, we appreciate Hey, to me, it, to me, it sounds like, to me, it sounds like he just believes everything that all of them have Back at the MGM Grand Garden Arena, the scene of their infamous pre-fight brawl, Jones and Cormier finally settled their score in the octagon. Against all odds and strategic forecasts, Jones made the extraordinary decision to engage Cormier in close quarters combat, a sphere where Cormier was deemed invincible. Through a blend of aggressive clinches, relentless knee strikes, and precision elbows complemented by an innovative sidekick, Jones not only contested, but dominated the wrestling game. He even took Cormier down multiple times, something no other opponent had ever done before. Cormier did his best to cope with the taller and stronger Jones. However, at the end of the fight, although both fighters were awarded a fight of the night bonus, all three judges gave the decision to Jones. I outgrinded him. I outworked him. As simple as that. I outwrestled him. I outworked him. I beat him at what he was good at. And uh, it was good. I don't know. I don't know. Uh... I don't know how to judge a fight, so, you know, I know I lost, and um, John won. That's pretty much all it boils down to. It doesn't matter if it's closer or if it's, if it's, uh... Cormier's battle calendar was neatly laid out with a bout against Ryan Bader in June 2015. Yet the MMA gods had a much wilder, darker narrative in mind. Jones, caught up in a whirlwind of controversy from his infamous hit-and-run accident, was unceremoniously stripped of his championship belt, sending Cormier straight into a title fight against Anthony Johnson. The rumble tried to counter. DC ducked underneath a clinch. From the get-go, it was a battle of wills. Johnson landed an overhand right that sent Cormier to the mat, but this was no ordinary fight. Cormier, fueled by determination and grit, turned the tide, winning the next two rounds, and finally, in a display of brutal dominance, secured a rear naked choke in the third round. He's gonna tap. And it's all over! Daniel Cormier is the new UFC light heavyweight champion! And the new undisputed UFC... He wasn't just winning a title, he was claiming his place in history, snatching a championship belt that hadn't changed hands since 2011. You know, man, I had the greatest conversation the other day. I was talking to John Smith. He's the head coach of Oklahoma State University, my college coach, and a six-time world champion from the United States. And I said, Coach, I said, I got to win this one. I, you know, I was like, in, in that moment, I felt like a 19-year-old kid again, talking to my coach and, and a guy that I idolized. And he said to me, in the greatest voice ever, he said, Daniel, 
you don't have to do anything. He said, you want to win. But if you don't win, whatever. He goes, I, I, I am willing to put your athletics career against anybody in the world and feel confident that you'll be okay. He goes, so you don't have to do nothing. He goes, you want to win for your family and for your legacy, but you don't have to. And when he said that, I felt this weight lifted. Like, you know what? He's right. Like, I don't have to win. I want to win. Cormier faced Alexander Gustafson five months later and won the back and forth fight via split decision. It was crazy. I, I remember my daughter woke up the next morning and she came into the room and I was all beat up and cut. And she goes, what happened to dad? Like she had no idea what happened to me because at that time she was only like four years old and I was just beat up. But it's those performances, man, those fights that draw the best of you. And those are the things that like then came Anderson Silva in July 2017, a fight that wasn't just a match, but a declaration of dominance. Anderson, Cormier threw Silva down like yesterday's news, dominating him from the get-go. Silva's counterattacks merely sparks before Cormier extinguished them with his overwhelming power. Silva's last-ditch efforts in the third round were adrenaline pumping, but Cormier was unmovable, ultimately keeping his title against all odds. Next, Cormier choked out Anthony Johnson again, cementing his legend. And then, the universe gave us the rematch we were salivating for, Cormier versus John Jones in July. You've had to take some ownership for what's happened over the years. When you look at DC, do you, is he a legitimate champion? Is that the real belt over there? Fuck no. You never beat me. You know what happened behind the stage? He's a bitch. He's a bitch. Who are you to say who's a champion? You're some guy that doesn't even fight. You're damn near retired, son. You're barely coming back. How are you going to tell somebody something? You're a retired man. Shut your ass up. Roles reversed. The hunter became the hunted. Now it was Jones' turn to be the challenger. With Cormier holding the UFC light heavyweight title. Early on, it was a chess match of violence. Jones unleashed a barrage, but Cormier, with the heart of a lion, plunged into the fray, each time with more determination. As they moved into the third round, the score seemed tied. Then, the world stood still as Jones delivered a head kick that spelled the beginning of the end. What followed was a merciless assault, a demonstration of raw power and precision that left Cormier defeated, a champion dethroned. never over. As long as you never quit, it's never over. I'm back here. Yeah. I don't know, man. I guess if you win both fights, there is no rivalry, so I, I don't know. Thank you for everything, Daniel. Daniel Cormier, ladies and gentlemen. Just when we thought the saga had reached its climax, a bombshell dropped. Jones, the newly crowned champion, faced a staggering fall from grace. A drug test revealed the presence of steroids in his system. Devastating news for John Jones, who tested positive for a banned substance around UFC 214. That fight with Dan the epic victory we witnessed erased as the fight's result was flipped to a no contest. The repercussions were swift and severe. Stripped of his title and suspended for a year by the UFC, Jones's triumph turned to ash. In a twist of fate, the light heavyweight championship found its way back to Daniel Cormier. And Dana White called me today. He said, uh, because of that, he goes, you know, the championship is getting returned to you. Uh, the fight is a no contest. If he cheated, he could not have fought and cheated and still won the fight. So uh, once again, I'm the UFC champion. Now, 
people will say stuff like, well, you got handed the belt. He cheated. And the reality is for me to say, I don't want this title when I was going to be in a championship fight anyways. Right. Financially, it's just a big difference if I don't fight as the champion opposed to fighting for a vacant title. Of I'm course. taking the belt. In January 2018, Cormier stepped into the octagon with Volkan Uzdemir and knocked him out cold in round two, snagging a cool performance of the night bonus. Fast forward to July, Cormier's in the spotlight again, this time going head to head with Stipe Miocic for the heavyweight crown. They're in the clinch, he breaks free. Guess what? Cormier nailed it with a stunning first round knockout, etching his name in history as the second ever double champ in UFC. Heads off DC, you know, good for him. You know, he's a two time champ, two division champ, you know, good for him. But he didn't stop there. Facing Derek Lewis, Cormier pulled off an epic rear naked choke in the second round, marking the first time Lewis ever tapped out in MMA. This victory wasn't just a win, it was a statement. Cormier became the first fighter to win and defend titles in both the light heavyweight and heavyweight divisions, proving he was not just a champion, but a legend. Fast forward to August 2019, a little over a year after their first epic showdown, Cormier and Miocic are back at it again, setting the stage for an electrifying rematch. Despite a promising start, Cormier found himself on the wrong side of a TKO in round four, bringing an end to his heavyweight reign. In August 2020, the saga continued as they faced off once more. This time, Cormier didn't get the comeback he hoped for, losing by unanimous decision, and took it as his cue to hang up his gloves for good. You know, I've had a long run. It's been great. I mean, I just fought my last fight for a heavyweight championship, and it was a pretty good fight, so. It was a great fight. Thank you, guys. Thank uh, you, sir. You guys have a great We appreciate night. you, brother. Thank you. What was it that made Cormier such a great fighter? You know, it's like he had a, a combination of things. But in your mind, what made him great? Gritty. He's got he's got a really good fight IQ. Um, he, he's good at breaking down his point. He's just he's tough. He's a tough guy. You know, he, he stood in there. Look how much bigger Stipe was than him tonight. And he stood in there toe to toe. And, and banged it out with, with Stipe, like LeBron James and, and, and was tweeting tonight about the fight. You know what I mean? When, when, when you have this many people, you know, you got people standing outside somebody's window watching through the window to watch the TV. There's a big fight on TV, and it's because of both guys, not just one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Could it be? Get it? Yep, 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 yep. There it is. Okay, go on, dude. Don't push me. I got it. Cheers. Yeah. But here's the twist. Cormier's story doesn't end in the octagon. Transitioning from a celebrated fighter to an esteemed coach, commentator, and community advocate, Cormier has continued to contribute significantly to the sport he loves, nurturing young talents and offering insightful analysis to fans worldwide. As a coach, he molds the champions of tomorrow. As a commentator, he brings the thrill of the fight to life. And as a community advocate, he champions the causes close to his heart. I've dealt with some shit in my life, man. I have had to go through so much from my dad, to my first kid, I lost my daughter back in 2003. Like I've had to go through so much. But I always say, anything that you have to deal with, it was like put on your journey. Like it, it's never clean. Like we never have clean journeys. 
We got to go through so much. And it's like in those moments, like, that's where you figure out who you are. Thank you for everything. That's why I am who I am today.